Hey everyone, welcome to Sunshine Hills Church Online. So glad you're joining with us today. Uh, Pastor Danny Hunt is bringing the message this week, the final message of our Victoria series, looking at the churches in the book of Revelation. Uh, before we get to that though, just a couple reminders. I want to remind you that our June missions focus is City Dream Center, specifically the summer hampers for our local schools. So we have adopted the school of JT Brown in Surrey. We're also going to look to cover the school of Sunshine Hills in, school, in Surrey as well this summer. Uh, we're, our goal is $1,000. That will cover hampers for all the families in need at both schools for the entirety of the summer. So if you are looking to give towards that, make sure to put City Dream Center on your ties envelope or your e-transfer, whatever it is. We'll make sure that money goes towards this great project. Also, if you'd like to be uh, involved in the actual giving out of the hampers and delivery, please connect with me or someone in the church office. We'll be able to give you those details. We'll also be posting them online soon as well. Uh, then the second thing is to remind you of, make you aware of, in two weeks on Sunday, July the 10th, we are so excited to have Brandon and Marcy Brzee with me, uh, with us, <laughs> with me, with us, with our church. They are our four square missionaries from Cologne, Germany. And finally, after a number of years, they're able to travel again and be back here with us in person. So we can't wait to hear from them. They're going to be bringing the word that morning. They're going to be sharing with us all that God is doing in and through them in Germany. And of course, our July missions focus will be the Brzee families. So we're looking to give towards them and their work in Germany on that day as well. That's what's coming up in the life of our church. Be as, as always, be sure to check out our Facebook group, our church website for more information, or contact the church office. Uh, Danny Hunt is up next with the final message of our Victoria series. Are you ready? Are you excited? Church starts now. Hello, church. Good day to you. Well, it falls to me to close out our series that we've been going through on the first three chapters of the book of Revelation, the th seven letters to the seven churches of Asia. And I've really been enjoying this series. I hope you have as well. I hope that collectively as a church, we've learned something from these examples written out in scripture and that as Jesus writes to these churches, that we would hear also what he is writing to us. And uh, I just want to remind everybody, if you have some insight or some opinion to share on this or questions or anything, those of us who preach, myself, Pastor Danny Jones, we love to hear from you. This is not a one-sided conversation. I know that <laughs> when I'm preaching, it's not like you can ask questions live or through the camera, but... Uh, I love to hear those questions afterwards. I want to have dialogue about this. I know the same is true for Danny. So please send us a message. Let us know what you think about this series or about anything that we're sharing from the stage or from the screen. Uh, so we titled this series Victorious because there's this line that comes up over and over again in all seven letters to the churches where before the promise is delivered, it says to the one who is victorious. And that really resonates with me because I like to be victorious. I'm very competitive by nature. It's something that I'm working on uh, because if I had to put it into the category of either character flaws or character benefits, it's definitely more of a flaw for me. I, I am highly competitive. I let it get the better of me way too often. I had to decide early in my marriage with Leanne that we, we should not be on opposite teams during games, if at all possible. We need to just be on the same team because uh, it's not good for our marriage if I'm competing against her frequently. I'm sure Danny Jones and Erica could share countless stories of youth group of when I let my competitive nature get the better of me. Specifically, Erica, who often found herself in the crosshairs of my competitiveness because, of course, she's also quite competitive and very talented. And so she was uh, often my nemesis in youth group games. And that competitive spirit really starts to burn hot, especially during my teenage years. My competitiveness, my need for victory, uh, even extends to like my schooling and my grades. There was this time where I was at school at Pacific Life Bible College, and um, we were writing essays. And the essay was worth a considerable portion of the mark for that semester. And so I did my best. I did a lot of studying to get a really amazing essay on paper and handed it in. And then the day that they were returned to us, the teacher was handing them out and said, hey, if anyone has any questions or comments about the essay uh, or about the, you know, the marks that I've given you, there's going to be some time after... I hand these out for you to come forward and speak to me if you need to. 
And so I get my essay back, and right there at the top, written in red, is 99%. And now, of course, what should have happened is I should have just celebrated getting 99% and, and really just enjoyed the victory there. But for me, uh, my first thought is, where's my 1%? Where, what, what am I missing? So I start frantically flipping through this essay, looking for where there's some sort of correction, some sort of issue where I have fallen short of 100%. And there's nothing. There's not a missed period. There's no grammatical mistakes. There's no spelling errors circled. There's not a single ounce of red pen. So, of course... I go up to the front to talk to the teacher. And I'm there with the other students, most of whom are there, to talk about their 45% or their 60% and asking how they're going to pass the class now. And then it's my turn to speak, and I go like, yeah, where's my missing 1%? And I can tell you I got a significant number of eye rolls in that moment. And the, the issue that I was having, and I, I was trying to say to this teacher, I need to know where the standard for 100 is so that I can know where I missed the one. You never circled anything. Well, and the teacher said to me, said, actually, I don't know if I did find anything wrong. I just don't believe it's possible to get 100% on an essay. And of course, being gracious and humble, I took that answer and I went and sat in my seat. No, I'm totally kidding. I elevated that to the president of the college and I got my 100%. I'm not proud of that. Like I said, something I'm working on. But the, the frustration for me was that I wanted victory. I wanted 100%. But when the image of victory, when the road to victory is unclear, when the conditions of success are unclear, how am I supposed to know if I've achieved it? I need an example. I need to know where the standard of 100% is so that I can know where I am on that scale. And that is what we're going to see today because we are going to be looking at the Church of Philadelphia. Now, as Pastor Danny mentioned last week, both the Church of Smyrna, which he spoke about, and the Church of Philadelphia get letters that have no rebukes, no correction, nothing from Jesus where he's saying this is an area that you're doing wrong. They're just both getting encouragement and commendation. And, I mean, that's hugely contrasted with the other five churches that get big rebukes. But even contrasted with the church of Smyrna, Philadelphia isn't even really warned about persecution. They're just given blessing and encouragement. This is the role model church. This is the victory church, the church that is doing it right, the church that Jesus says, good job, keep going, love what you're doing, no notes. So, Let's jump into the text today. Let's see this church, and let's really try and say to ourselves today, how do we walk the path to this church's reality? Because they are here among the seven as an example of what we should be. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 7 to 13. It says, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true. Who holds the key of David? What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is coming, that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we desire to be like this church. We desire to be a church that is 
after your heart, that is walking in your ways, that is keeping the faith, that is holding fast to your word and not denying you in any way. Lord Jesus, would you instruct us, would you teach us today how we can follow the example of the Church of Philadelphia to be a shining beacon of your gospel truth on this hill. In Jesus' name, amen. So, as with all of these letters, we are just sitting in front of a buffet of imagery. I mean, it's just filled with different images that we can talk about, but the one that is right off the top and really jumps out to me is this picture of Jesus as the one holding the keys and the one that says, what he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. Now, this is a callback to an Old Testament passage in Isaiah where it talks about another man in the city of Jerusalem who we now recognize as being sort of a a precursor of Jesus, a, a typification of Jesus to teach the people about what Jesus will be like. And this man held the key of David, the key to the city, and so very literally what he went around opening and unlocking, no one else could lock up, and what he would lock up and close, no one else could open. And so this is a picture of Jesus. It says he holds the keys of David. And this isn't a key to the current city of Jerusalem, the earthly city of Jerusalem, but to the new Jerusalem. It's saying Jesus has the key to heaven. Jesus is the one who opens wide the heavenly gates and allows us to enter. But he is also the one who can close those gates against the enemy and against those who do not belong there. Jesus is the one who opens and the one who closes. It says in other parts of Scripture that Jesus has the keys to death and hell. He can close up those ways. He can shut the gates of hell and lock away Satan and all of his demons. This is an encouragement to the church in Philadelphia. Jesus is saying, I'm the one in control. I'm the one who opens. I'm the one who closes. So don't worry. The world can't open and close what I have deemed should be opened or closed. I'm the one who holds the keys. And there's so many more things that Jesus has this power over. When it says he's the one who opens, I think about him opening pathways in the desert, opening highways through the sea, opening ways of um, new avenues of evangelism, or opening roads so that we can march on the territory held by the enemy. But simultaneously, he can close things. He can close the doors in my life that should never have been opened. He can close the gate of the city, so to speak, so that we are safe and so that the enemy can't attack us. He can close off the roads that the enemy would use to advance on us. Jesus is the one who opens and closes. It talks about um, the person who is victorious never leaving the city of God. And this, again, is this image of Jesus opening the way to heaven, but then closing the doors behind us so that we cannot be taken out of his presence. And that's just a beautiful picture. St. Augustine puts it this way. He says, Who would not yearn for that city out of which no friend departs and into which no enemy enters? As we go about the work of Jesus, as the Church of Philadelphia goes about his work, they are comforted knowing that the doors ahead of them that they need to walk through, Jesus can open and no one can shut. But simultaneously, the doors to either side where they could be attacked, Jesus can close those and no enemy can open what he has closed. It specifically talks about him opening a wide door in front of them. And this, from context, we know is a door of evangelism. It's a term used very often in the New Testament, especially in the book of Acts, to talk about pathways or inroads into new communities, new cities, new ways of teaching the gospel to to, to the lost, to people who need to hear the good news of Jesus. And so he's saying, I've got this door of evangelism open to you. And this isn't a shock. This city of Philadelphia is often called the gateway to the east. And it's because uh, if you look at the map um, here, that Philadelphia is located in such a place that all of the coastal cities of Turkey and, and what was Asia Minor in the Roman province at the time, all of their roads sort of funnel to Philadelphia before coming out through the, the Anatolian Plateau and then into the east. And so a lot of trade and traffic went along the road through this city. They would have been a city filled with immigrants filled with foreigners, filled with people that speak different languages, come from different cultures, people who eat different foods, dress differently, and have different religions and cultures and backgrounds. 
I think that sounds pretty familiar, uh, and it's no, not lost on me that Vancouver is often referred to as the gateway to the east, although technically in the other direction, I suppose. But for Canada, and I mean even for North America in general, we are a city that is a gateway to other cultures, a gateway to uh, lands far off. And when people come from uh, f across the Pacific, when people come from India and China and Korea, Japan, the Philippines, wherever it is, Vancouver is a spot that people come through to get into the rest of North America. And so Jesus' encouragement to this church, hey, I've placed you in this place. And I've opened a door for you to share my gospel with the nations. That's an encouragement that we can very much appropriate for ourselves. Jesus is saying, hey, Sunshine Hills Church, I have placed you somewhere that is incredibly diverse. Somewhere where the people that you need to evangelize to, you don't need to go hike miles to find them. They're coming to your front door. And I've opened a door for them to hear my gospel. But you have to be faithful to speak it. The Church of Philadelphia was given this amazing task. They are the church in the city that is the gateway to the east, the church in a city just filled with people that would, we know from history, hear the gospel and then take that gospel message that changed their lives and go to their homelands and influence change for Jesus there as well. But Jesus says to the church in Philadelphia, he says, I know that you have little strength, he doesn't mean physical strength. He's talking about numbers, finances, influence. Of the seven churches of Asia at the time of writing, Philadelphia was the smallest. It was the weakest by that metric. There were other churches that were much more influential, much larger in terms of numbers, in terms of how much weight they carried in their city. Philadelphia was just a, a small group of faithful believers. And yet they would go on to grow to be the largest church in the area, the most influential church in the area in their day. Their faithfulness was a way for them to overcome what in a worldly sense is weakness. And this is in keeping with what we know of God. He loves to take what the world says is weak and use it to glorify himself in his strength. Now, their weakness obviously wouldn't have been a, a surprise to them either. They, they're probably looking around and going like, it's great that we've got this wide door of evangelism open to us, but we're, we're so few. We aren't the big mega church of, you know, that city over there. We're not the super influential church of that city over there that has all the, the money and the celebrities going to it. We're just, we're just here. We're just our, ourselves. What happens when the enemy comes to close this door? We can't fight against all of the city. But this is where it comes back to Jesus' encouragement. It's, it's him, it's Jesus that has opened the door for them to evangelize. And therefore, no one can shut what he has opened. Now this church, it did face significant persecution. They were doing the right thing. They were following Christ. And any time we follow Christ, there is persecution. That's just the way it works. It says that they face persecution from the synagogue of Satan. We talked a little bit about this last week. This is not a cult, by the way. The synagogue of Satan is not saying that there's like an occult Jewish presence. Uh, synagogue, just like it means assembly or gathering. It's the, the place where the Jewish people would gather together. And when Jesus refers to them as a synagogue of Satan, he's simply saying that instead of advancing God's agenda, this group of Jews was either wittingly or unwittingly advancing the agenda of the enemy. And one of the ways that they were persecuting or punishing the Christians of this city was that they were shutting the door of the synagogue against them. Now, for us, so far removed from Middle Eastern uh, first century life, we're probably thinking like, okay, well, is that so much of a problem? Do Christians go to a synagogue? But at that time, synagogue wasn't a religious place necessarily. I mean, it was, but it was more often a community center. For the Christians who were Jewish by ethnicity who converted and who started to follow Christ, having the synagogue closed against them would have meant that they can't send their kids to Hebrew school. They can't get an education for their children. It means that they're often unable to attend weddings, funerals, family gatherings. They would be cut off from the community life that they had grown up in. And this would be incredibly difficult for them to bear. 
Furthermore, Philadelphia as a city is referred to often in history as Little Athens because of the number of idols and temples built there. It would seem that on the many roads that come into this city that false gods would come along those roads but then get super tired and then just stop in Philadelphia. Thank goodness our God is not tired. He goes along any road he wants. But there was just so many false idols in this city And so the pagan community of this city, from which a number of Christians would have been converted as well, they also would have been shutting the door against the Christians, saying, oh, well, if if you're worshiping that Jesus guy and not going to come to the temple, you're not invited to our feasts anymore. You're not invited to be in the community that you grew up in. You're not invited to the weddings. You're not invited to the funerals. You're not invited to the barbecue, you know? And we talked with uh, some of these other cities as well, that for the Christians, this also would have meant losing out on business opportunities, losing out on opportunities for education, losing out on opportunities for advancement in uh, their workplace or in the government. Whatever it is, the Christians of the city had lots and lots of doors closed against them. Yet, Jesus says to them, you have not compromised, you have not hidden, and you have not denied me. He says, you have kept my word and have not denied my name. What a commendation that in the midst of such persecution, such pressure from the outside, this church has stood strong and said, no, 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 we will not deny Jesus. No matter how much it hurts, no matter what the world throws at us, we are going to cling to him and to his word. And I mean, I can imagine that it would have been easier (laughs) from a worldly standpoint to deny their faith. Maybe to just keep their faith a little bit private, save it for Sunday, and in the workplace, you know, just just don't mention it. And if someone, we should keep religion private, right? If someone doesn't ask, then don't tell. That wasn't what they did. They didn't hide their faith. They didn't hide Jesus. In fact, they spoke boldly and openly about Jesus because they recognized that open door of evangelism that he had opened for them. Sharing our faith Sharing the gospel is important. It is so central to who we are and what Jesus wants from us. You know, like having, having a faith and knowing the gospel, it's, it's kind of like ordering a really big plate of nachos at a restaurant. You're not actually going to get in trouble if you just keep it to yourself, but it's clearly meant to be shared with other people. And so the Church of Philadelphia, they were sharing their faith despite the persecution. And Not only were they doing that, but we see that they were succeeding. Jesus says that a remnant of those who are persecuting them, of the synagogue of Satan, will come and fall down at their feet and and admit that they were wrong, admit that Jesus has loved them. What a powerful image. Now, I needed to check my own heart when I first read this. Uh, My head immediately went to like, yeah, that's right. You admit that the Christians were right. And then the Holy Spirit was like, no, 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 you fool. (laughs) You don't get it. This isn't so that the Christians could boast or to gloat over those who had hurt them. But when those who had been persecuting came and fell down and said, we see now that God has loved you, it's an opportunity for us to pick them back up and say, and God has loved you too. And you're welcome here. Jesus is walking with this church He's opening the doors in front of them so that they can have victory and success in what they're doing as they are boldly proclaiming the good news to a city in need of hope. And then we come to the promises at the end. And there's three images here uh, that are just really, really rich and beautiful. There's the image of the pillar, the image of the names, and then when you put the two together, the images of the pillar and the names. (laughs) So the image of a pillar, I mean, this would have been very um, forceful imagery to the city of Philadelphia. Philadelphia was a city racked by earthquakes. From the time of Jesus' birth to the time of the writing of this letter, just one lifetime, really, they had already had two earthquakes destroy the city and like ruin whole buildings and parts of the city that had to be rebuilt. Between the writing of this letter and 1900, they would have another 10 major earthquakes. 
And then in 1969, they had their most recent earthquake, which again destroyed a portion of the city. This city was being hit by earthquake after earthquake after earthquake. At a certain point, you just move. Just go. Don't settle there. But hey, I'm not in charge of it. The architecture of the city has crumbled. Crumbled to dust. Earthquake after earthquake means that all the ancient things can't stand for that long. And so when Jesus says, I will make you a pillar, it's an image of sturdiness, of steadfastness in the midst of a world that is shaken. He's saying, you won't be shaken. Clinging to me, I will make you a strong pillar in the temple of God. You will not be shaken. Even when the earthquake comes, you will stand tall. And there's this beautiful truth about this, which is that the modern city on the site where ancient Philadelphia was, it has an architectural ruin left, pretty much just one. It's not the walls of the city. Those have crumbled to dust. It's not the pagan temples. Those are just piles of brick. It's not the synagogue. It's not the Roman forum. It's not the the Roman offices. Those are all crumbled to dirt. It's the pillars of the church. The pillars of the church still stand strong. And obviously, that's just a, a cute anecdote because those brick and mortar pieces mean nothing, but it's an image of the influence that we can have when we are faithful to Jesus, when we do what he's asked us to open, walk through the open doors that he has opened for us. Our influence as a pillar in his temple lasts for thousands of years. The other image is one of the names. He says, I will write on you the name of my God, the name of the new city, Jerusalem, and Jesus's new name. And these are all, again, beautiful images. The the idea that Jesus would write his own name on us is one of, it's it's an image of ownership. It reminds me actually of Toy Story where Woody, under his boot, he has Andy's name written on it to say, oh, I belong to him. And for us, having Jesus's name written on us, Jesus is saying, that's mine. That person is mine. I, they are part of my family. They're part of my group. And I love that. I love that for multiple reasons. One, the security and the encouragement of knowing that I'm his. But furthermore, Jesus, in looking at this faithful church, is saying, I will not be ashamed to have my name on you. You are doing a good job, and I want people to know that you are with me. There's also the image of the name of the city of Jerusalem being written on them, and this is an image of citizenship, right? Like a passport, like ID, saying, I am a citizen not of Philadelphia, not of Asia Minor, not of Rome. I am a citizen of heaven. And therefore, the job that I'm doing, I am here on behalf of heaven as an ambassador for heaven. And then it also says that he'll write the name of God on us, which is an amazing promise. It kind of throws us back to the Old Testament, to the priests who had a gold plate that they would wear on their forehead that said the name of God, Yahweh, on it. This image of priesthood, that when we are in the temple of God, we are his priests, we are his mediators, we serve him. And that he would want us to do that is an encouragement as well. So then we take these images and we put them together, the image of the pillar, the image of the the names. And when you have a pillar written with names all over it, what you have is a monument. And this would have been a common image in that time. Often, especially before sort of sculpture really took off, you're not going to spend the time sculpting a statue of a person. So instead, when you had a, a, a hero of the people, you would just erect a pillar with their name on it. And that is the picture that we see here that Jesus is saying, you who are victorious, you who have done what I've asked, who have been faithful through the storm, you are a monument to God's goodness. The name of God, the name of Jesus written on a pillar that we are that pillar that when people look at us, they would say that is a monument to the goodness and the power of God. That is the promise to this church, to the one who is victorious. And that can be the promise for our church if we are faithful, like the church in Philadelphia, to follow after Jesus. So when looking at this church, obviously an amazing role model to aspire to. But I have to ask myself, were they perfect? Was this a church that was sinless? I mean, obviously not. 
We know that that can't be the case. There must have been sin. There must have been issues there. Those people aren't perfect people, and therefore that church isn't a perfect church. And yet, Jesus doesn't correct them for anything. He doesn't call out any sort of issue. He just commends them. So why is it that they have none of their issues looked at? Well, this brings us to another passage, 1 Peter 4, verse 8. It says, Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. This church wasn't perfect, but what they had in spades was love. That's why they're getting commended. And interestingly enough, the name Philadelphia actually means in Greek, brotherly love. Now, the city carried that name long before this church existed. In fact, long before Jesus walked on the face of the earth. And it was named that because the king who founded it just had a lot of love for his brother and kind of made a city in his brother's honor. But the church would end up picking this moniker up for themselves. They truly were the church of brotherly love. The church that loved one another deeply and the church that loved their community deeply. And it's for this reason that Jesus opens the door for them. It's for this reason that they are able to withstand the pressure and the persecution from outside. It's for this reason that they're given such an amazing promise of victory. If we want to be like the church of Philadelphia, it's not complicated. There's no 15-step process that's all convoluted on how to get there. It's just simply saying that we have to love Jesus and we have to love one another. And as we love, we find that the door that Jesus has opened for us is wide and easy to walk through. The burden that would be placed on us is light and easy to bear. The love that we have for one another is how we step forward into the future that Jesus wants for us. So the question for all of this series, as we go through all seven of these churches, is which one are we? Which one do we want to be? Are there any that we're on the path to becoming if we're not careful? Now, I don't think Sunshine Hills Church is at the place yet where God has hermits living on islands sending us letters. Thank goodness. But the, this whole series has been about introspection, looking at our church and saying, who are we and who do we want to be? Do we want to be like Ephesus? Did all the good deeds while their first love grew cold? Do we want to be like the church of Sardis, who cared so much about their reputation while their own faith died? Or do we want to be like the church of Laodicea, who settled for a lukewarm and ineffective Christianity? We could, if we're not careful, be like the church of Pergamum, the Church of Pergamum allowed false teaching to infiltrate the church, or worse, we could be like the Church of Thyatira, who tolerated wickedness and compromised with evil. Or we could end up being like the Church of Smyrna that we talked about last week, who did everything right and yet still were dealt persecution in, in heavy measure from the world. But I'll tell you which church I want to be like. I want us to be like the Church of Philadelphia, a church that is commended for their good deeds, a church that walks through an open door of evangelism into their community, a church known for their love, for their endurance, for their steadfastness in the face of persecution, a church that makes Jesus proud. So I encourage you, I encourage me, let's walk towards that with everything we have, cling to Jesus, and hold on to him as he takes us on this journey. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for these examples in Scripture. We thank you for the wisdom that you desire to share with us so that we can be the best church that you would have us be. Lord Jesus, we recognize that we are not perfect. We recognize that we slip up, and so we ask for your grace to be on this church. We ask for your forgiveness in our times of weakness. And we ask that you would constantly be guiding, teaching, correcting us when we need it. Lord, encouraging us when the road gets hard, lifting us up when we fall. Lord, would your spirit be in all of our ministries. 
from the nursery, the smallest children, to our seniors group, and everyone in between, Lord Jesus, would your Holy Spirit be just binding Sunshine Hills Church together in love and pushing us towards your preferred future. We thank you. We praise you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you're watching and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, but you would like to, I just want to invite you to join this amazing family called the church, to come in and just rest in his arms. He is calling out to you. He has opened the door to heaven for you, and he wants you to walk through it. And wherever you are, wherever you're watching this, whether you're watching this in your living room or sitting on the bus and watching on your phone, it doesn't matter because he's with you wherever you are. And all you have to do is say, Lord Jesus, I accept that you died on the cross for me. I ask you to bring me into your family and Lord, to forgive me of my sins. And I call you now my Savior and my God in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that, if you asked him for that, he is faithful to, to rescue you, to invite you into heaven. And I'd love to hear about that journey because it's an exciting one for every person. We celebrate every time someone decides to make that choice. So please share it. Well, that's it for our time together today. Thank you for joining with us on this series. Starting next week, we have some amazing new stuff coming up for the summer. We have some guest speakers. Uh, we have a whole new series that we're going to be embarking on together. And I hope you're ready to learn what Jesus is saying to our church. Until then, have a great rest of your week. God bless. Thank you.